Hello and welcome back to another nuclear craft tutorial. This time it's straight after the molten salt react tutorial we just did. How to um, make, first of all, your uh, fly salt fuels, how to put them into the reactor, how to deplete them, and how to, more importantly, produce your hot coolant for use in what we're going to talk about today, the heat exchanger. So the heat exchanger is the most recent addition to nuclear craft. It was added like a couple days ago. Uh, and basically this is how you actually produce steam. Now, we can head into the... Um, heat exchanger tubes, which is where all the magic happens. We can look in JEI. This is the first thing we'll look at, just to see what this thing actually does. Um, the first thing you'll see is uh, a load of numbers. We'll get into what those actually do in a second. Um, but you can see that we're taking um, hot eutectic NAC alloy, which is uh, and hot eutectic uh, coolants in general, and we're going to use the heat exchanger to cool them down. And of course, what you then do is you then just loop this back into your reactor and you have this sort of closed system of coolants that gets uh, pumped into the uh, reactor, heated up, and then put into the heat exchanger. And the reason you want to do that is because at the time that this is uh, cooling down, um, in another tube, if we head over here, you will see that we're going to be heating up water into high pressure steam. Um, so this is the thing you want to make. Now at the moment, Nuclear Craft does not add its own uh, turbines and it's planned uh, that there will be high pressure turbines and low pressure turbines. So right now this high pressure steam does not do anything, but you can turn this high pressure steam into usual steam that can then be used in uh, pretty much all the other mods um, steam generators, steam turbines or whatever. So that includes mechanism, uh, that includes extreme reactors, that includes advanced generators probably as well. So that's the sort of standard steam that's used by most mods. And as you can see, it's just another heat exchange recipe. It's just cooling down this high pressure steam a little bit. Um, so let's actually get into um, how you are going to produce, first of all, the high pressure steam, and then we'll get into how I recommend producing the normal steam, because at the moment that's the important thing, because that's the thing that you can use in the generators available to you right now. So the way you build out the heat exchanger is pretty similar. You've got yourself a um, heat exchanger frame, which is like the sort of skeleton of the design. I'm going to actually put this a little bit far away because the last time I built one of these heat exchangers, I built it way too close and it was pipe spaghetti all over the place. So I'm going to make sure this thing is big enough that I don't have to uh, worry about any space. I'm also going to build it quite long. You'll see why in a second. I'm going to have some tube systems in there um, that go along. So I want to make sure it's long. Um, okay, so there is our shell. And now I will uh, continue to fill in this thing. You know how to, how to do this. You just place the shell in to the sides and you can also have a transparent shell as well. Okay, so I have my shell basically complete. Um, I'm going to leave these two sides open for now and you'll see why in a second because I'm going to have to sort of work along this axis here. Um, so the way that the heat exchanger works is actually a lot simpler than the molten salt reactor. The reason that video was short, by the way, is basically because, as I said before, it's sort of just a liquid version of that thing over there with a few different differences, um, but not many. This thing is a, t a totally new machine, um, but uh, it is a lot simpler. There's literally only one block that actually really does anything inside it. Um, but there are three Three tiers. So there's the sort of copper tier, there's the hard carbon tier, and there's the thermoconducting alloy tier. Um, the only difference between these is sort of the efficiency of the heat exchanging. So you'll get a lot more bang for your buck from your hot coolant, and you'll produce a lot more um, steam um, if you use this sort of high-end stuff. It is a lot more expensive, um, but uh, you will get the most out of your hot coolant um, if you use this high-end stuff. Uh, I'm going to use it for now uh, because, uh, well, why not? I'm in creative mode. I might as well use the best thing. Um, so what I need to do is I need to get this hot coolant into the um, heat exchanger and I need to have it pass along a tube line that is adjacent to it. So the way that this sort of works is I pump hot coolant. Let's say I, for, for argument's sake, let's actually get this hot coolant line going. So let's load up this thing and uh, load up um, some hot coolant. So let's take this line across. This is my hot coolant line from before, remember, um, if you saw that video. And I'm going to take this hot coolant across and I'm going to put it into a heat exchanger vent. So the vent works in exactly the same way as here. You just pump stuff into it. And it's a way of getting stuff onto the inside. And similarly, the tubes, these heat exchanger tubes, have sidedness just like they did before on the uh, vessels and heaters in there. So my hot coolant is going to come in here and it's going to pump the hot coolant into this tube. Then what I'm going to do is I'm literally just going to have a line of tubes. Now, of course, you can have any shape of tube you want and the more sort of twisted around each other they are, the more efficient, but I'm just going to use the simplest thing, which is just a line of them. So I'm going to spread the, uh, the fluid uh, along these lines. I do exactly the same thing as before. So uh, input spread just means that I'm going to take whatever is being uh, input here, which in this case is hot coolant, and I'm going to just spread it down the line. Oh, actually, one thing I should mention is that unlike the... Um, 
vessels and heaters, this actually starts disabled. So um, by default, the sidedness of this thing is actually disabled. So make sure to hold down shift and set the other side to default mode. The reason it's um, set to disabled by default is as you'll see, um, you're going to have a lot of tubes next to each other and adjacent to each other and you don't want them to sort of share their fluid. Um, so I set to default by shift right clicking and then input spread. Oops. Default, input spread, default, input spread, and so forth. And then I just take this all the way to the other side. But then when I get to the final one here, I'm actually going to set this to um, product out. So all of the fluid is going to come in here, all the hot coolant is going to come along this line, and it's going to be deposited um, at this final vent here. And I will take this vent and put it there. And all of my hot coolant is going to circle round and I can usually, what I'd normally do is I'd have a fluid duct that takes this cold coolant and pumps it back round and loops it back into my reactor to be heated up again. But you know how to do that, it's pretty simple stuff. I'm literally just going to bin it because you understand that basically what you'd normally do is you'd have it in a loop. Um, but for now I'm going to bin it because it's just easier for me to set up. Like that. And again, you're going to need a servo because these things don't uh, push out to anything other than tubes. Um, so if you're trying to push out to a pipe, you will need a servo or whatever, a wooden pipe or whatever. Okay, so there's our hot coolant line. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, get some water into this thing. Um, now there is some physics involved in this heat exchanger and there is a little bit of maths. The most important physics involved is the idea of contraflow. So in a heat exchanger, um, usually when you have two fluids flowing past each other, um, if the uh, temperature, if the hot temperature, so in this case the hot coolant, um, if the final temperature of that coolant, um, so the cold coolant, is uh, needs to be colder than the output of the steam, then you need to do something called contraflow, which means that you need the water to be flowing in the other direction. If you have the water flowing in um, the same direction as the hot coolant, then what it basically means is that physically it's not physically possible for the temperature of the steam to get high enough or the temperature of the water to get high enough from the coolant to actually produce any steam. So you need to make sure that the water comes in the opposite way. Now of course it doesn't actually necessarily have to be in a line, it doesn't have to be in a horizontal line. You could also have the, the water actually coming down um, perpendicularly to this line so you could have a whole row of hot coolant um, like this uh, going along one axis and then you could have water coming down the other axis as long as it's not parallel um, it will work but I am going to use opposites because it's a little bit easier to deal with and a little bit easier to set up so uh, well a little bit easier to see basically um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this usually it's best to set up these things before you have any fluid uh, traveling anywhere so I'm going to place an infinite water source here and I'm going to make sure that these things aren't connected. Water is going into there, and now I'm literally going to set up a whole other row of these heat exchangers. Okay, so here we are, right at the end. And we're going to push out here. So all the water is going to travel along here, as you can see it's already in these pipes, and we're going to finally have a vent uh, that it pushes out to. And what we're going to do here is I'm going to just quickly break this pipe because otherwise we're going to have uh, crazy stuff happening all over the place. And I'm going to um, just make sure these are connected. And there we go. Now I can connect these back up again. I'm actually going to use a super laminar fluid duct here because um, there's going to be quite a lot of steam produced. And so I want to make sure that these pipes actually deal with it. Um, now, usually, if you're actually going to design this, as you'll see when we go into the mathematics, you're going to have to, you're probably going to need for most designs more than just one length of tube. Um, but we'll see exactly how you work that out in a second. I won't, I won't tell you exactly what the calculation is because it depends on your design, but I'll tell you how to work it out. Um, so there is some maths involved, uh, but you can also just sort of guess it. You can sort of trial and error it if you're not interested in doing some maths. Uh, because this machine is pretty simple, and it's pretty qualitative um, if you don't want it to be sort of mathematical and perfect. Um, it doesn't matter if your tube is too long. What really matters if your tube, tube is too short because then you're not producing um, the coolant quick enough to go back into the reactor. If your tube is way too long, it doesn't matter. It will just spread itself out and all of the uh, coolant will um, heat up the steam as, as, as usual. So now I'm going to bring this um, fluid up round. For now, I'm going to just bin it because um, we'll deal with that in a second. Because this is where our high pressure steam is going to come out of. And then we're going to have to build another row of uh, tubes to deal with, with how to turn the high pressure steam into normal steam. Um, but for now, what we're going to do is I'm going to just finish off this uh, design. So let's just let's just put glass here, um, and let's put some over here as well. There we are. So this thing should be finished now. 
There we go, heat exchanger. Average efficiency, 50%. The reason that is because half the tubes don't actually have anything in them at the moment. Um, so let's turn this reactor on, and we'll get some hot coolant flowing. So the hot coolant is now going into this thing, and you will see, um, if we break into this thing, that the hot coolant has started to spread itself out along this tube line. So now let's turn this thing on. And if we come over here, you will see that we're getting some coolant out. You can see that's actually cold coolant. If we turn the servo off, you'll see. There we go. Eutetic net redstone, cold, cold version. So that's flowing out. And if we head around to the other side, you will see that we're getting high pressure steam. So I need to actually put a servo on this thing, otherwise it's all going to get stuck. So there we go. High pressure steam is coming out of our heat exchanger. And the reason that's working is because of the contraflow. If we had this flowing in the same direction, it would not work. I promise you, you don't, have, you don't want to waste your time doing that. Um, so there we are. So that is um, a basic setup uh, that is producing high pressure steam from, uh, from water being heated up by hot coolant. Okay, so now let's understand what's actually happening inside there. So if we head into the JEI recipes of this thing, you will see, first of all, that the hot eutetic NAC mixture, all of the different um, coolants, have particular heat, requ uh, heat required. So that's the heat required to actually complete this recipe. So it depends on how good the, uh, the coolant is. So the better the coolant, you can see the more heat required. That basically means it lasts for longer. Um, and the heat required basically says um, how long it's going to last in the tube of the heat exchanger. The temperature uh, it tells you uh, when it's going from hot to cold, that tells you it's going to be a cooling recipe, and that's sort of signified well, as well by the red to blue arrow. And for something like water to steam, you can see that's a heating recipe, so the temperature goes from 300 to 1200 in this case. Now, the heat required, um, the, the way that actually ticks up per tick, um, the amount of heat that's actually given to uh, the tube holding the fluid per tick is dependent on the heat difference of adjacent tubes. So for example, in the tube holding the hot eutetic uh, redstone mixture, um, that requires 10,800 heat. And if we head to the other recipe that it's sitting next to, it's adjacent to the tube carrying the water and the high pressure steam, you will see that the temperature difference for this recipe is 300 to 1,200. That's 900 Kelvin. So that means it's going to um, give 900 heat per tick to the redstone sitting next to it. And equivalently, you can see that um, uh, hot eutetic to cold eutetic goes from 700 to 300. That's the same for all the coolants. So that means that this 32,000 heat will tick up at a rate of 400 heat per tick, because that's the um, temperature difference and that recipe. So that basically means if we take 32,000 and divide it by 400, um, we're going to get uh, 320, so that's 800. You no, know, that's not, that's 80, sorry. 80. Um, ticks per recipe. So that means we're going to get 1,000 millibuckets per 80 ticks, which roughly translates to about 12 millibuckets per tick. So that's 12 millibuckets per tick um, per uh, full tube. Now, some of these tubes might not be full. We'll head in there and actually see. Let's have a look. Um, you can see it, has actually, it is actually full. You can actually see that the hot coolant here is actually uh, being backed up. And that's actually going to be quite dangerous because otherwise this thing won't actually be able to cool because it will um, run out of space to actually put the depleted fuel. So let's actually turn that off for a second. Um, so this basically tells us that our tube line is not big enough. Um, so that basically means that either we're, produce, we're not getting the coolant in there quick enough, which doesn't look to be the case. Um, the other thing is that we don't have enough tubes that, is, uh, that are producing um, high pressure steam. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to, in, usually what you do is you'd set up another tube line here that was turning water into high pressure steam. That means that um, you're going to cool down the hot coolant much more quickly because then it's sitting next to two tube lines rather than just one. So you have to add up the contribution, the, te the heat contribution, um, from every adjacent tube tube line. Uh, that's sort of the way that you um, add up uh, this amount of heat that's being generated. So for example, say if our um, water to high pressure steam tube line was sitting next to um, four of these um, hot coolant lines, then it would actually increase at a rate of 400 times four, which is 1,600 heat per tick. And that would mean that this would only last for about 20 ticks. Um, so 20 ticks is one second. So that would be um, a bucket per second of steam. So it does make sense. The more tubes that are next to each other, the higher the rate of heat exchanging. So you want to make sure that these um, designs are nice and compact usually. Um, for this tutorial, I'm just sort of showing you two tube lines because it's just easier to show off. But in big designs, you're going to want to make sure they're also all compact. And um, the longer the tube line, of course, the more surface area you're exposing for more uh, tubes to um, do the cooling and heating in. 
Um, so if you want to work out how many tube lines you're going to need and how long those tube lines are going to be, what you want to do is you want to work out how quickly you're producing hot coolant, and then you're going to have to work out um, basically how quickly that hot coolant is going to be cooled down and that will tell you how many tubes you're going to need. Okay so this is when my future self is going to jump in uh, because I didn't explain how to calculate how much hot coolant you're producing very well in the original take so here I am. Uh, the way you work it out uh, is uh, pretty simple actually. Um, so we get told here how many coolant heaters we have. Now that's the total number of coolant heaters. Um, if you've got like different types of coolers in there um, you're gonna have to want to keep track of that. Just do it on like a sign or something just let yourself know how many you've got in there. Um, it won't change once you've built it I guess. Um, so in there at the moment we're all using redstone um, so just redstone coolant um, so this number's good enough. We know we have 18 redstone coolers in there. Now by default um, if the configs are not changed then uh, the coolers will transfer if the cooling efficiency is 100% which is just when um, the vessels are at 100% efficiency. That just means that they're all uh, not adjacent to each other and there's no moderators going on just like in the solid fuel reactor. Um, if the cooling efficiency is 100% then it will trans uh, transmute um, cold coolant into hot coolant at a rate of one millibucket per tick. Um, and that's per coolant heater. So that would be 18 millibuckets per tick of hot coolant. But you can see here that the cooling efficiency is 240%. Um, the way that number's actually got is if you look in here, you'll see the mean fuel efficiency, which is sort of to do with how the vessels are placed next to each other and the moderators and so forth, is 260%. But you can see here that we're doing a little bit too much cooling, so that number's brought down a little bit because some of the cooling is redundant. So the cooling efficiency is 240%. This is the number that matters. And so all you have to do is you uh, take the cooling efficiency and divide that um, one millibucket bucket per tick figure, uh, or multiply that one millibucket bu bucket per tick figure, sorry. So because we're at 240%, that means each of the heaters is actually going to be producing 2.4 millibuckets per tick on average. Um, so 2.4 times by 18, uh, that is 43 millibuckets per tick. So 2.4 times 18 is 43 millibuckets per tick. So we come over here now and we say, okay, we got 43 millibuckets per tick. Um, now, just because, of course, it's best to always build bigger heat exchangers than you need than smaller ones, let's just round up to 50. So we've got 50 millibuckets per tick of hot coolant coming in. So how many of these heat exchangers do we need in order to make sure that we can deal with this stuff? Um, so let's look at the recipe here. It says um, 20 uh, at a time. So uh, 50 millibuckets per tick divided by 20 means that we're going to have to do two and a half of these recipes per tick. So two and a half times the amount of heat required. Um, so that's roughly um, 25,000 heat uh, required per tick. So 25,000 heat per tick. And then we come over here to this recipe, um, which tells us this heat difference is 900. And then all we need to do is do 25,000 divided by 900, um, which is roughly um, 25,000 divided by 1,000. So that's roughly 25. So that tells you that you need at least 25 um, water tubes to go past your coolant tubes. So we obviously do not have enough here. We've only got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we need about three times, uh, sorry, yeah, we need about three times more and then we'll actually be able to deal with all this hot coolant coming in. So you saw before there that we were backing up with hot coolant and that's because we didn't have enough tubes. So actually what would happen is probably if we built um, another water tube line across here and another tube line down here, we probably have enough water tube lines to deal with all the hot coolant. Um, so that's basically how you work out how many you need. And from that, you then produce a load of high pressure steam, which is exactly what we're doing over here. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is build a whole new heat exchanger, which is going to take this high pressure steam and it's going to produce the normal steam that we need for use in a steam turbine from another mod, say. Okay, so you can see I've pretty much built exactly the same thing, a little bit different at the front, but otherwise it's basically the same size. Again, this is just a tutorial build, so um, don't take this um, completely, uh, you know, how you'd normally build it. As I said before, you want to build it a bit better than this. Um, this is just to show you how it works. Um, I've actually got the reactor turned on again. Um, I probably don't, oh, actually no, it's off again. I turned it off. Um, okay, so now I'm going to set up pretty much the same thing. So you can see here that I've got the uh, water over here again. So the water coming in. Um, and again, that's because I need that contraflow. Uh, and let me just explain a little bit more detail what I mean by that. So if we head back into here, you can see here that the temperature goes from 700 to 300. Um, while the recipe for this uh, thing here goes from 300 to 1200. Now physically, um, if that recipe um, is, I want that recipe to happen, you'll notice here that the temperature of the water heads past um, the old temperature 
of the coolant. It goes past that 700 Kelvin. That's not possible unless you have contraflow uh, in real life. Um, you'll notice here that there are other recipes, like this um, condensate water to preheated water goes from uh, 300 to 400. Uh, in that case, it would actually be possible to set up um, a, uh, this, this heat exchanger um, without contraflow, but right now there's actually no good reason to produce that preheated water, and there's also no way to produce condensate water either. But in the future, when we add steam turbines and stuff, that stuff will be actually really useful. Um, and for that reason as well, you might not always want to use these um, infinite water sources at every heat exchanger. But for now, because that sort of stuff's not in yet, you might as well just use these infinite water sources at, or just sources of water um, because they're pretty cheap and you don't need to worry about um, condensing any of the um, like steam from steam turbines in most uh, reactors from other mods. Um, but anyway, let's set up pretty much the same thing again. So let's get ourselves um, some of these uh, heat exchangers. So let's set these up as we would before. Um, let's actually do it this way. It's going to be a bit easier. So I want the uh, water coming this way. So that's default input spread, default spread there we go okay so that line's done and now the other line so this time we actually want the um, we want the steam uh, we want the steam high pressure steam coming in this way so you want this first one to be the fluid uh, sorry the product out and then we want this to be um, a default side that's right and then all the rest of these are just um, fluid spreads there we go Okay, so that's all set up properly. Then let's get our vents, put them in the right place. There we are. So let's make sure that we actually set this up in the way that we want to before we start throwing any fluid around. Uh, so maybe what I want to do here is I want to use, uh, this probably it won't work, this probably needs to be a laminar fluid up because there'll be too much stuff coming out. Um, so let's put that there, let's get a servo on there. And let's use some laminar fluid ducts here as well. So um, the hot coolant, as I said before, don't worry, we won't worry about that in this tutorial. Um, so the water's going to come out here. We're actually going to get steam out of here. Now, um, steam, um, we actually probably want to have just head straight back into the loop because, uh, no, sorry, this is going to be water being turned to high pressure steam, right? Because this high pressure steam is going to come through. It's going to be cooled down into steam, but it's also going to heat up the water coming down the other way. So we might as well just loop this back round and heat the water coming in that's been turned to high pressure steam back into steam again. So we've got this sort of loop going round to produce some extra, some extra normal steam. So that should be pretty easy to set up. That's how I recommend doing it, by the way. That's why I set it up like that. And now we're going to have to bring this steam that we're producing um, all the way round from here. So let's get this uh, whole fluid duct going all the way around the back of this heat exchanger and bring it over to this new one. Oops. Um, there we are. And now let's get this wall complete. And we can actually turn this thing on and actually start producing normal steam. And finally, the glass around here. Oops. Okay, and let's turn this thing on. And we should see here, we're getting some liquid steam. There it is. That's the steam that you can use in big reactors turbines, in mechanism stuff. And you can actually see we're producing so much that this, uh, even this laminar fluid is having a bit of trouble. And so this is the example of how you'd want maybe to spread out the, uh, the uh, final uh, tube. So let's actually do that just to show off what I mean by that. Let's have um, a fluid, an input spread. Um, actually, probably, we just probably want a product to spread, actually. We probably just want to spread the product about. So let's do a product spread to here. And we want to uh, turn this side to default to uh, take the steam out. And then another product spread to here. We put a vent there and we'll put another um, laminar fluid duct, another servo. And that should now all work a bit better. So this now is taking steam. These are both taking steam out. And this is still getting clogged up because apparently the laminar fluid ducts don't like that. Let's do that to just make sure it's all split up in a way that it can deal with it. There we go. That's a bit better. So these are produce, producing steam at a, quite a rate um, because the high pressure steam is very hot, remember? So that's coming in, turning into steam. And the, uh, sorry, so the reason really is because this cold water um, is so cold compared to the high pressure steam coming out the other side that it's actually cooling down this high pressure steam very, very qu quickly. So this high pressure steam is coming in. It's also, of course, getting the high pressure steam from this water supply here that's coming in the other way. 
And so that's why we're producing so much steam. And so this amount of steam is very easily going to uh, produce enough to deal um, with a big reactor. So you can set up a big reactor turbine here or a mechanism turbine. And that's how you make steam to use in other mods turbines. Um, in the future, of course, if you want to use nuclear craft high pressure turbines and then low pressure turbines, you don't do this. But that option of um, default normal steam from other mods is always going to be there if you need it. So I think that's pretty much all there is to say about heat exchangers. Again, I haven't filled you in too many of the details of how to make good designs, but I think it's pretty simple. You just make sure your tubes are in contraflow if um, the uh, temperature difference is uh, go, go past each other. And just make sure that you uh, fill up these um, heat exchangers to the brim so that lots and lots of tubes are touching each other so that you get maximum efficiency and maximum speed. Um, I'm going to go through the maths of this one more time for this example, I think, just to give you the idea of, again, how you do this. So I know... Um, say after I've calculated how much uh, high pressure steam I'm making I know how much high pressure steam is going into here I know what the temperature difference is for the recipe um, so I look at this temperature difference I say okay high pressure steam uh, being turned into steam that's here that's a temperature difference of 400 Kelvin um, so uh, sorry 400 yes 400 Kelvin that means I'm going to do 400 heat per tick I know how much uh, heat I need for this recipe okay I see and then I say, okay, this temperature difference is actually 900. So that's 900 per, uh, per tick for this 4,000 heat recipe. That's why it's being produced so quickly, because um, that's literally what, that's like four and a half ticks on average. Um, steam, a bucket of steam is being produced per tube. Um, so that's very, very fast. That's the sort of math you want to do. Again, it doesn't matter if your heat exchange is too big, but it doesn't matter if it's too small, especially when it comes to the hot coolant loop, um, because if all your hot coolant starts getting clogged up here, uh, then you're not going to have anywhere to pull the hot coolant out of, and that means that the normal coolant coming in won't be able to actually do anything, and then your reactor will um, overheat and melt down, and that's exactly what you don't want. Um, so, yeah, I think that's pretty much everything. Um, if you've got any questions about the heat exchangers or the molten salt reactors, do post in the comments below. Um, I hope you have great fun with these. I've been working on these for such a long time, um, and they're working pretty well now. Uh, I'm really looking forward. I've looked. For, I've really enjoyed over the years looking at people's awesome solid fuel designs. I cannot wait to see what people do with these things. I'm sure that people, especially with the molten salt reactors, will come up with some crazy setups, and I really can't wait to see them. So make sure you let me know about them. Join the Discord chat and uh, show everyone what you're doing. And I will see you in the next video. I don't know what that will be, um, and I don't know when that will be. It will probably be when I show off the um, the turbines whenever I add them. I hope to add them as soon as I can. I've got uni coming up, so it will be a little bit slow, but we'll see what happens. Um, so yeah, once again, thank you very much for watching. Enjoy this, and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.